I'm Lisa, and oh, getting used to this. And I started Action Potential Lab. <laughs> You're awesome. We have a teamwork going here. Um, and that's Toronto's first science and art laboratory. Here's what it looks like in the summer. <laughs> Don't we all miss that so much? Um, it's housed in a hundred-year-old pharmacy with original wood floors and tin ceiling, and it has original gold foil writing that says Stan Walker Drugs. I even got the opportunity to meet Stan Walker's family, and we just chit-chatted about this laboratory that's been in the community at Christie and Davenport for so many years, and has a really long lineage of being um, kind of, oh, sorry, many iterations of pharmacies throughout the years, and then, funny enough, other creative spaces have moved in, and now, currently, I'm using the space. <laughs> um, here's what it looks like inside. Uh, the lab is um, a space where I desired to combine science and art education for people of all different ages. For kids, for instance, this is an example of our microbiology workshop and we're doing some uh, samples of everything from around the lab to what grows in between your toes. <laughs> um, we do youth workshops for uh, grade five to grade 12, everything from, um, well, we do a lot of dissections. <laughs> and here we're using squid and octopus and we get a lot of our medical paraphernalia from the UFT med store and uh, we try not to shy away from anything too much. And then an example of some of our adult workshops, this is something from our molecular gastronomy workshop. Um, we do mixology using kind of scientific tools in creating the drinks and also some other dissections including cow, heart, and lungs. So just to give you a brief overview, I want to talk a little bit about myself because I think that plays a part into how the lab began. Um, how the place even came to be what it is today, and then maybe some tips that I've learned along the way that hopefully will shed some light and give you some inspiration to start your own space. All right, let's dive in. <laughs> um, so my background is actually fine art. I went to art school and I studied in a program called uh, Studio for Interrelated Media. And what that means is that I got to play around in lots of different materials uh, in the hopes that you would come up with some kind of idea at the end. <laughs> so I really do believe in interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary learning. It's, it's how I've really focused my whole educational experience and even my work experience. Um, so within SIM, I did fibers, I did film, sculpture, and even performance art. And in this very open-ended program, I was exposed to like I mentioned, lots of different materials and media, but also concepts. And uh, within art school, I found out about a movement in art that's relatively new called biological art or bio art. And the idea behind that is that you're creating artwork that makes reference to or is inspired by science or using the tools and technologies of science. And it was through art school that I realized, wow, my whole educational experience growing up was very siloed. You know, you were either a technology or math or science kid, and I was art, and I only focused my extracurriculars on that. Um, so much so, only applying to art school, and realized I didn't have a firm understanding of science, and more than that, the world around me and how things came to be. So funny enough, it was through art school that I had to go backwards and, and, and learn about science. Um, so through third and fourth year of art school, I basically set up a studio. There was a pharmacy college across the street from my university, and I became friends with a microbiology professor there, and I set up a studio and started growing bacteria and mold and making paintings that grew over the length of the exhibition and taught myself very introductory biology. Um, and this is some of the work that I was creating with petri dishes and things that grow over time. 
And through that experience, I got introduced to a program called Symbiotica, which is at the University of Western Australia. And it was one of the first of its kind to uh, bring scientists and artists together to work on new research. And they have a wet lab or a biology lab. And the focus isn't just artists doing fun things for scientists so they can do great research. It's supposed to, and hopefully a successful project is when it's an equal collaboration. Um, and there's been some really fascinating programs. So I went to do my master's there, um, and I received a master's of science with a specialty in biological art. Here's some examples of projects. This is a fashion designer. She was growing a garment out of fungi, and it grows in time into, she seeds the scaffold, and then it grows into that garment. Um, this is another piece, Victimless Leather, by the, my professors, Jonat Zur and Oren Katz, uh, where we have a piece of uh, skin cell that's been seeded and growing over the length of the exhibition into the shape of a suit. Um, so it's kind of tongue in cheek. And then at the end of the exhibition, you actually have to kill and cull this living piece. So there's a lot of ethical issues around this work and a lot of biological art. Um, I ended up doing my thesis work in sleep science and spent a lot of hours watching people sleep and we worked with dancers to mimic and relay those movements in performances in the daylight. But all that takes me to 2012 when after all of that education I moved back to Toronto and I was looking for other people that were working in this intersect and I started to make connections and reach out and I realized that Toronto was such a creative hub. There was um, Hack Lab, which I was introduced to at the time, and really interesting multidisciplinary conferences like Settle Technologies that had been going on for years, um, really exciting startups that were happening around that time, and it made me think that Toronto was primed and ready to go for alternative education spaces, that maybe it wouldn't be so difficult to test out this idea and this vision that I had of starting a space that combines science and art because there's a lot of people talking about it and we're interested, but there was no hub. So I thought, what would it be like to start my own? Um, and when I say it started with a vision, it was a vision, there we go, of people in lab coats at street level working away at research. That's really how it started. I wanted to see kids, youth or adults having their research exposed because usually in science it's behind closed doors and you don't get to see what people are doing. And I was really inspired by the maker space culture and DIY bioculture that was emerging in Toronto and around the world. And so I wanted to play off some of that. And the idea of working in a space that you could just see by passing by. So I'm going to share with you some early tips and experiences and tools that I used or found helpful or had to learn the hard way um, as I started Action Potential Lab. Grants, yay. <laughs> so, um, thank you. So these are some of the things that I tried to pull upon in my experience. I looked for grants that were age specific. They stemmed, there was grants for religious purposes or geared towards females or entrepreneurs, early career startups, education spaces. Really, the idea was that if there was any card that I could pull from, I would go for it. And I really encourage, and I've been saying this to so many people, if there's anything that fits you or your character, you'd be surprised there might be some opportunities out there. So pull from your cards and use it. Um, I also took a lot of courses. I took business courses, and I also met with other creative entrepreneurs that were running even small workshops or four-week courses. For instance, I took a class with um, an amazing woman who has a background in fine art and in business, Jacqueline Sava, who started Soap Gouache in Toronto. And through those courses, I learned about um, alternative business models, hybrid business models, the benefits of profit, non-for-profit, and so on. So that just really gave me some language and, and tools to keep me more informed because I had never studied this kind of stuff before. And I guess maybe the main uh, take home was to learn about the approaches that were out there and see how it could apply to my own and how we could alter them to fit for this idea of a science and art lab. I also did residencies, and this is really common for artists, and that was my background, but residencies more and more are becoming open to just other creatives. 
So I wanted to speak about part, mm, yeah. <laughs> Spark Box Studio, which is in Prince Edward County. This is a fantastic space started by two artists. Um, and they have converted an old farmhouse into a printmaking studio and also just two general purpose studios. And the idea is that you could go for whatever length of time that you need to work without distraction, as you can see. <laughs> There's not a lot going on <laughs> around the space, but that is a really fruitful time when you're coming up with ideas and Sparkbox has an opportunity where they give six free residencies a year for any Canadian um, that's 20 to 35 years old. So I would encourage everyone to apply because they are fantastic and the opportunity is just so incredible. But it was during this time that I used their kitchen to start little science experiments. I was growing things in the studio that they lent me, and I was writing early lesson plans on how to mix science and art together. Oh, I also want to say one other thing. There's a residency that I did at the Art Gallery of Mississauga, and they were trying to bring artists into classrooms in the Peel region to help flesh out and invigorate the art program in the classroom. And uh, specifically, they were interested in educators that were touching upon STEAM and STEM learning. And because the lesson plans that I had written in Sparkbox were science and art combined, they were of particular interest to the teachers um, in Mississauga. So I got a chance through that residency to go into classrooms, and that was one of my first opportunities to teach this content to elementary school students. And I recently went online and I saw there's even more opportunities for early career artists and educators and designers at the Art Gallery of Mississauga today, so you should check that out. Um, that brings me to connecting with the community and making connections and collaborations. When I found the space, um, it was really kind of by luck. I had been looking all over the city to see where can I find this street view level of having a lab for kids and adults and teenagers. And so I was going around the city because there's amazing pockets of you know, everything is unique and really exciting. Um, and so I would go to the neighborhoods and I would talk to people. I would stop people on the street and tell them my idea and see what they thought of it and if they thought their neighborhood was the right fit and just get a sense of the people because I thought if I was going to be creating a multidisciplinary space that it was going to cater to the environment and those people too would help make this lab thrive and alive. So it needed to be kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, and even amongst one of those conversations, um, I remember I was speaking to a mother and she said, oh yeah, there's a place for rent just up the street and that's how I found the lab. So just by ch talking to people. Um, but the benefit of just being connected with the community is that these are the people that hopefully will come to your space who knows, you know, if you're having a multidisciplinary space that, um, you know, touches upon so much different, sorry, lots of different subject matter, there's many people that you can call upon to collaborate with in the lab. So for instance, one of the neighbors is a science writer and historian, and we started a series called Cosmos and Cocktails, and we would invite different astronomers, but this started with, um, this professor and we were uh, doing a lecture on astronomy and then we would match with a local uh, mixologist and the mixologist would make a drink live based on the talk at hand so you would get some learning and some booze um, this is a collaboration we did with artist patty lung who was here uh, earlier today and we made barf bubble machines yeah <laughs> And so we wanted to play around with the science of bubbles because this was a question that a lot of our students were asking. So as a way to give the science, we thought it would be nice to have a hands-on, take-home experience. And so cr we created these really hilarious kind of gross machines where you had to barf out the bubbles onto a piece of paper. The bubbles do have paint in them, so you're making like a barfy picture. It's really cool. <laughs> um, and so... Moving on, starting your own STEAM laboratory. I really want to stress the idea that you do not need any bells or whistles or high tech or fancy gear to start your own space at all. I think if you can find some kind of place where you can set aside, whether it's a home or a part of a room or a community center or a classroom or a coffee shop, 
just somewhere where people can be creative and get messy, I think that's really the first step. And then finding people that are like-minded that want to collaborate with you and attend or kind of brainstorm ideas. For instance, uh, before we had the space, I was doing a project called Biolab on Wheels, where my uh, friend Roberta and I were using our bicycles as kind of makeshift uh, laboratories and going to spaces and bringing our digital microscopes and just engaging with the community. Here's some of our hacked pieces there. And um, this is just a really fun idea I wanted to share of some of the most important materials that I found in, in my experience at the lab and, and hopefully this will can inspire you as well. I know it's a long list, but I'll just basically run through it. Using chalkboard paint, and you can paint a space and have you know, really great ideas and a graffiti board instantaneously. Setting aside cubby shelves that you can just get from Ikea or anywhere and make it a cabin of curiosity and have it an exploration space. A roll of craft paper, we use this all the time for brainstorming or just random costume making. <laughs> um, Rubber gloves is so important, especially when you're doing a lot of DIY biology and you're not really show, sure how it's going to grow or grow into or if it's safe. Gloves are really important. You can get them at Costco. Super easy. Uh, we use Ziploc bags for collecting specimens, painter's tape all the time, and a digital microscope that you can get for less than $100 on Amazon. And it's provided so much interest and entertainment for kids up through adults. So that's been so beneficial. I'll leave you with this fun image, but I think that the conversation of having a STEAM, STEM, or any kind of multidisciplinary space is now becoming part of the common vernacular, and that's really exciting. That means that maybe the challenge of convincing people to have a space like this maybe won't be so hard, but I think the next step is furthering that, that discussion and pushing the boundaries. And I think Toronto, like I mentioned, is ready and open for more spaces. And I cannot wait to see what other STEAM, STEM, or any other acronym space develops in the future. So I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you.